if we go up to a man and a woman standing together, we're much more likely to address the man before the woman. If mm. we have a man and a woman on a radio panel, we're likely to ask questions of the man before the woman. And it is just a result of our inbuilt unconscious biases. Let's discuss some of this morning's stories with the former editor of The Times, John Witherow. Morning, John. Good morning. And the author, Marianne Seagott. Morning, Marianne. Morning. Let's talk about uh, well, a couple of stories, I suppose, coming together. The UK is on par with Russia for confidence in how the political system is functioning, according to a global survey. And the Times has this brilliant story on the front page. Scott Benton, MP for Blackpool South, prepared to help an investment fund influence policymakers and obtain behind the scenes information, despite rules prohibiting MPs from lobbying in return for payment. Uh, John, it's a really good story. Perhaps the most Shocking thing about it is that none of us in the, in in our studio were that shocked about it. It felt that this was um, not that surprising that they'd be able to find an MP who's willing to do this. Yeah, well, Mr. Scott Benton should have studied his political history a bit better because if you cast your mind back to the mid '90s, there was the whole cash for questions issue then when the Guardian and the Sunday Times exposed it, and exactly the same thing: MPs taking money for putting down questions and. He's fallen for the same the same old trick, uh, and he should have, he should have known better. He should have seen this coming. Um, but you know, it, it it's a nightmare for Rishi really because the cash for questions in the '90s started the whole sleaze allegations against the Tory government, then which led to their their disintegration in 1997. And and Rishi would be very worried that they're now going to be tainted with the same kind of brush. And the problem is, for John, isn't it, that when you've been in power for 13 years, this type of story does tend to, to come along. And it's almost impossible to argue against that narrative, isn't it? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't know what it, they've suspended him quite rightly. Um, he'll probably lose his seat at the next election. But, but how, how does a party try and rectify this? I mean, it, they would have been delighted if the Labour Party were caught doing it, but it's not. It's the Tories. Um, so it's, it's a real problem for him. Interesting. Um, Mary, I mean, uh, we, we talked also about, you know, he's the head of this APPG, this all-party parliamentary group on gambling. You know, there's been a report this week into those groups, which seem to be an excuse for a jolly often. Some of them do really good work, but some of them just seem to be there because it's a sort of a bit of a, a knees up. There is a sense, and maybe it's unfair, that on the, at least on the fringes of our parliamentary system, there's always something not quite right. Yes, and uh, it's interesting that these all-party parliamentary groups don't seem to be holding... Uh, the industries that they are talking about to account, they seem to be sort of in the pockets of these industries. And so, you know, Scott Benton, when he was be we're talking to these investors, talked about bad news. He didn't say bad news for the gambling industry. It was just sort of assumed that if there was going to be more regulation, that was bad news <laughs> objectively. Uh, and so you know, everything he said was aligned with the interests of the gambling industry. And as John said, it was incredibly, uh, incredibly naive of him to fall for this sting. But also he's very disingenuous in his excuses afterwards. So he says he checked with the standards commissioner as to whether what he was asked to do was allowed. He wasn't asked to do anything. He proactively offered to do things. Yeah. He was actually asked by the Times reporters, what would you be able to do for us? And he went through this whole list of things that he could do, all of which were against the parliamentary rules. Um, Quite extraordinary. We had Richard Holdall on, who's the, for your government today, and actually he's on an all-party group which is against gambling. Uh, and he was really disgusted. When Asma asked him about it, he just he, you could hear the anger in his voice that, that this was going on, that this industry does seem to have got its tentacles into parts of the democratic system, and he wasn't very happy about it. What do you make of the faith in democracy, Marianne, in that survey? That Although um, the, the, I suppose the belief in, in our political system was low in terms of how we feel it's being conducted, there seemed to be quite a high belief that democracy was a good thing, which is, which is probably a good thing in itself. Yeah, that really cheered me. I mean, I'm not at all surprised. These questions were asked in 2022, and I'm not at all surprised that people's um, satisfaction with the way the parliament, the p political system was working was very low because 2022 was pretty much a nadir from that point of view. And I suspect if they were asked again this year with two you know, pretty competent main party leaders, uh, support for the way the political system is working would rise. But more generally, when asked uh, whether democracy was a good way of governing the country, that ha that the, the, the number of people saying yes has risen substantially. So in 1999, only 76% of people said democracy was a good way of governing the country. And that's gone up to 90%, which I think is very cheering. And it's been even more dramatic amongst the young. So 
Uh, as recently as 2005, millennials, only 67% of them, only two thirds of them said it was a good way of running the country. And that's gone up to 88%. So, you know, from time to time, democracy doesn't perform very well, or at least the parliamentary system doesn't perform very well, but it does tend to right itself. And, you know, this year is a lot better than last. Mm. Let's um, uh, move on to uh, a subject that's divided our listeners, I would say, pretty much 50-50, and that's um, calories on menus. Uh, they, they've been in um, effect for a year now, actually, but uh, calorie counts on menus should be scrapped because they are a dangerous policy that harms people with eating disorders. This is according to research from Beat the UK's eating disorder charity. Uh, John, I wonder whether it's possible to see both sides of this particular argument that um, having calorie counts on menus is useful for people who are trying to watch their weight, who are trying to go from obese to a healthy weight so that they don't put pressure on the NHS, while at the same time potentially accepting that having numbers on menus um, kind of weaponizes food for people who already see it in that way. Well, I, I must say I love seeing calories on menus, um, and it does affect the way you eat. I think. I mean, you see, you, you look at something like that, that looks delicious, and then you see the calorie count, and you go, "Oh no, I'm going to have soup or a salad instead." Um, so it does affect behaviour. It's classic nudge theory, isn't it? And I, I think it's positively excellent. And I, I can't see really why it should affect people negatively, because um, you know you, we've got to use all sorts of methods to try and tackle obesity, whether it's it's, it's this sort of nudge or whether it's tax or whether it's doctors being more assertive with people with obesity problems because it's just a huge burden and we've got to do something about it. I suppose we won't know. I mean, you've given anecdotal evidence there that it, it works for you. But I mean, from what I can see, you don't look like you have any uh, problems with obesity, John. Um, oh, you big flat the, the battle. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, but the problem is, of course, is that we, we, we need to wait and, and have some kind of actual accurate measurement to see whether this is having any effects, and I don't know what that measurement will be in terms of obesity rates in the UK, it seems quite a small thing. But the point about people with eating disorders, John, I think is, and it was articulated to us earlier on by BEAT, is that uh, this, this kind of promotes an unhealthy relationship with food for people who already see food as a challenging thing, as, something, as a set of numbers, as, as calories rather than nutrition. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have thought they're more of a minority than those who are having problems with weight. Mm. And you, in, this, in the end, you've got to kind of do what's best for the majority. Um, and if it does help, I mean, I, we can see over a period of time if it makes a difference. I guess if it doesn't, it could be dropped. But it seems to me a pretty sensible move. Mm. Marianne, what do you think? Yeah, I was quite surprised by the survey because I would have thought that I had imagined that people with eating disorders would know to the nearest calorie how much any piece of food contained already. And therefore, having it on the menu wouldn't make much difference to them. I mean, I do believe the survey and I, and I think it's very difficult for people with eating disorders. But I agree with John that the vast majority of people looking at calories on menus um, don't have eating disorders and may well be helped by them. I think it's great. I love being able to see, you know, sometimes you think, oh, I'll go for something healthy like a salad mm -hmm. and you discover it's actually got more calories than some, you know, yeah. a hamburger. I think that's the case of McDonald's, isn't it? Not that I often go. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so broadly, I'm in favour. But, you know, maybe maybe you could say that restaurants should be able to provide a menu without calories on special request. You know, there should mm -hmm. be ways of, 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 of um, you know, being able to help people with eating disorders so then uh, they're not deterred from going out to eat at all. That's a good idea. Uh, John, I just wonder, in your old age, are you becoming a bit of a nanny, a nanny state man that you want high, <laughs> you know, taxes on sugar, you want menus telling you what you can and can't eat? Uh, because we often talk about the obesity problem. It's such a huge problem and, and maybe actually there is time for, for, for greater intervention. The, the government flirted with it, didn't they, with Boris Johnson and then have backed well away from it because of the culture war. They believe that Tories don't like that sort of interventionism. Are you, are you becoming more of an interventionist? Yeah, I think that's a specious argument. I'm, I'm a big nanny state man. <laughs> I think we can do lots. The impact of obesity affects all of us. It affects the National Health Service to an extraordinary extent. Um, and, and for those who are not obese, they suffer as a consequence. So I think... It's in the interest of the state to do the utmost to help people lose weight and not to put it on. So I don't have any problem with that. Um, 
uh, we could talk about oysters in terms of their, their nutritional content. The, the king is in the news uh, again. The Duchy of Cornwall scheme to phase out Pacific oyster farms on its land has prompted concerns What's that it the could. the calorie count on them? And, uh, <laughs> I bet they're probably pretty good for your oysters. I think so, yeah. yeah. Like, there's, there's very, very little, very little carbs in, in, in an oyster, John. So you go, go, go right ahead with them. <laughs> um, let's talk about the king more generally rather than his view on oysters. Um, what do you make of, uh, of Queen Camilla, um, John? The concept of Queen Camilla, the, the, the coronation's coming. Um, the re- complete rebranding of, of the king and queen together. She, she's gone on this huge PR journey from being really disliked. And actually, we were talking yesterday, uh, John, that Times commenters at the bottom of the, the article on Queen Camilla yesterday, they were a very, very sceptical bunch. They hadn't forgiven her for what happened with Diana and there wasn't a great outpouring of love for her. Are you surprised by that? What do you make of how the king and queen are shaping up for the coronation? Yeah, I was genuinely surprised because I think she's a good thing. And, I, and I'm... I, I'm accepting her as queen rather than queen concert is absolutely fine. I think I never quite understood what the concert was. It was a, it, it was a trying to get it through in a more gentle way, wasn't it? And then it's obviously been ditched. But I don't have a problem with that. I think she's positive for the king. Um, she's a funny, intelligent, interesting woman. So I'm I'm entirely in support of her. Mary Ryan, what do you make of it? Are you surprised that there's still this scepticism? When we, when we had people texting in, it was, again, a bit of a split. Some people were, were very pro about her, but some people could never get over what happened in the, in the 90s. Yeah, I, I'm quite surprised, actually. I agree with John. I think she's uh, funny and mischievous and has her heart in the right place, all of which I approve of. Um, I mean, what happened in the 90s really was... It was something that the monarchy brought upon themselves by demanding that Charles marry a virgin from the aristocracy. And there weren't all that many around, frankly. Uh, And, you know, he was, what, in his late 30s or something. And so he was forced to marry a 19-year-old, which was just bonkers. And they had nothing in common, and they were both very unhappy. And if he'd simply been allowed to follow the dictates of his heart, as, as William's been allowed to, you know none of these problems would have occurred in the first place. Uh, let's, so, yeah. I'm sorry for everyone involved. Right. Let, let's t- talk very quickly about um, women's worth, Marianne. Uh, women earning 88 pence to every one pound earned by a man. Um, I was trying to ex- kind of having to explain this to my daughter the other day and I kind of gave up because I was so ashamed that this, that this still happens and still exists. Why does it happen, Marianne? Well, interestingly, there's been a... A little bit of an example here. Now, I I don't suppose either of you did this on purpose, but this is the first item on which you've come to me first rather than John. Mm. And uh, I've written a book called The Authority Gap, which is about how we still take women less seriously than men. And this is one of the things we automatically do. If we go up to a man and a woman standing together, we're much more likely to address the man before the woman. If Mm. we have a man and a woman on a radio panel, we're likely to ask questions of the man before the woman. And it is just a result of our inbuilt unconscious biases. And so one of the pieces of research I uncovered when writing this book was that 70% of men will evaluate a man more highly than a woman for achieving exactly the same goals. Mm. And so a woman can be every bit as good as a man, and yet it's the man who gets evaluated more highly, is more likely to be hired, more likely to be promoted, and therefore more likely to earn more. And at every stage uh, of a woman's career, she is held back by this, that we overestimate men's competence and underestimate women's competence. And that's at the root of the gender pay gap, I'm afraid. And and is this to do with, because um, that's so, it's very interesting, is this to do with the men who push themselves forward and present themselves in a different way? And I'm not saying that the women don't, or is this to do with inbuilt prejudices? Uh, It's both. So it is inbuilt prejudices. But part of the problem is that we tend to confuse confidence with competence. And they're absolutely not the same thing. Mm. Now, boys and men are encouraged and trained to be more self-promoting, more overtly confident than women are. And if women then emulate them and act as confidently and as assertively as men, they tend to get penalized for it. People feel uncomfortable about it. And they start using words about them like, oh, she's quite abrasive or aggressive or strident, isn't she? When actually she's behaving just the same way as her male counterparts. Mm. And you may say, oh, well, women should just um, grow thicker uh, thicker skin and who cares if they're disliked? But actually what the evidence shows is that likability is a much more important factor for women 
than it is for men when it comes to being hired or promoted. Very and interesting. therefore for women, you know, you're either not confident enough and therefore you're disrespected or you are confident enough and then you're disliked. So it's much more difficult for women than for men. Isn't John, that changing as more women take senior positions um, and therefore promote women? So that will it is, change. But very well. slowly, very slowly. You know, mm. we do, we've still got, you know, two or three times as many men as women in a position to promote, you know, in, in the C-suite. And therefore, mm. it's a very slow process. I think, you know, we could speed it up if we were more aware of these unconscious biases. Um, mm. John, do, did you, do you care about likability, about being liked in your career? Uh, uh, well, you probably know it hasn't it hasn't applied to me. I'm um, probably fairly unlikable. But it doesn't. I honestly did not know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> you don't get many likable editors of, of either uh, gender. Is this? Uh, no, I can't speak to many. <laughs> is this something that you're aware of, though, John, um, or is it something you're becoming aware of? You know, throughout your career at the times, were, were you? Was this something in the back of your mind that you know I need to? employ more women obviously on merit i need to hear more women's voices i need to um i i need to 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 speak to them first yeah, i was this... very conscious of it oh. and i was worried there weren't enough senior women at the times so i kept trying to promote ones to take up senior editorial roles mm. i mean I, I appointed emma tucker as my deputy who's now editor of the wall street journal who has been absolutely brilliant and i'm very conscious of of hiring women and making sure they got paid just as much if not more than men so when, if there is an unconscious bias, I was trying to trying to counter it. That's interesting. Thank you very much for that. That is uh, John Witherell, uh, former editor of The Times and the author, Mary Ann Seacart. That issue of confidence and competence being aligned. Do you know what the thing you should never do, and I do this, I don't know if you do this, the, the, the no worries if not knee-jerk response. Do you ever do that when you send an email when you when you assert you want something? Yeah. And then just as you're, you're kind of about to sign it off, you go... No worries if not. Yeah. And that's, certainly, I think, probably more, I do it, but I think more women do it than men, famously. And it's a sort of thing where you're just sort of apologising for, for taking up the trouble. And you've got to have enough confidence not to do that, mm. but you can't let it be yeah, confidence I, blind you. That's so. true, but I think, I think there is a difference because if you're asking for something that's, that you're kind of completely entitled to, which is a meeting about something, then I don't think you should apologise. Yeah. But if, for example, you're asking for a favour... Yeah which I've been doing a lot of recently, yeah. um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, promoting stuff. Book coming you, out. Yeah, exactly. You feel a bit bad and you say, mm. if you don't have the capacity, yeah, yeah. please just tell me. I uh, won't mind. Anyone who's got a book coming out or had a book coming out <laughs> just knows the utter degradation and debasement <laughs> you have to do because you, oh, you, you just want someone to read it and you, you hate yourself all the time for doing it, but that's what you do. Please, please, please. And no then, worries if not. No worries if not. Oh, God, it's pernicious. <laughs> and if you like that... You can listen to us. We're sticking asthma. Have you forgotten? Well done. Every Monday to Thursday on Times Radio Breakfast. <laughs>